Hello, I'm Robin and welcome to this bumper, super booth infused May edition of Malton Music Monthly. Well, I've got shed loads of stuff to talk about this month, so I'm going to dispense with the pithy introductions and let's just get straight in. So Superbooth, it was Superbooth again. Hooray, hooray, I'm sure you are all bored, silly, with Superbooth by now, and probably rightly so, but I was there for a day and it was fabulous. A fantastic time. It was great meeting people. Thanks ever so much if you came up and said hello. I hope I wasn't rude. I hope I was as awesome and in person as you seem to think I might be over the camera, which, which is great. So I hope I didn't dispel any of those weird delusions I saw a lot of stuff, talked to a loads of people, saw some music being played. It was it was great. It has this real festival vibe now. It used to be this hot house powered inside the Fez complex where you felt like you were some kind of extra in a strange 70s sci-fi movie and you were shuffling around from place to place being bombarded by a barrage of sonicness. It wasn't quite like that anymore. Now they've, they've pushed it out and you're feeling like relaxed and groovy. You can chill out with a beer, make music, you know, meet some friends, have a lovely time. That seems to be much more the vibe they're going for, which is which is great. I think they've really pulled it off. I mean, the weather, I think, is a, is a huge factor. Had it been pouring with rain, it might have been a very different experience. But as it was, it's spread out. You've got these tented areas. You've got food vans. You've then got bungalows somewhere else. And you've still got some stuff inside. So it, it was great. Music going on, concerts, performances, all sorts of stuff. It's a fabulous thing. If you've never been, you really should, should endeavour to do so. And while this multi monthly will highlight my highlights from Super Booth, it's not going to be exclusively about that because other things as well happened that weren't necessarily at Super Booth. So I'm going to be tackling those as well. So let's get on. The big news was probably Oberheim. I think. We knew about this a little bit. There was there'd been a tease and we thought about it and we thought, yeah, he's gonna release an OBX, isn't he? It's gonna be some big mother of a synth. And yeah, that's absolutely what it was. So Oberheim has done the thing that everybody wanted them to do and has built the the evolution of or the homage to all of his greatest hits. So we have the OBX8. And in a nutshell, it's three synths in one. It's the OBX, the OBX-A, and the other one that I can't remember. Oh yes, the OB-8, that's right. So it's got all three architectures from those synthesizers stuffed into one lovely looking, Oberheim looking keyboard synthesizer. So you've got SEM filters in there, you've got filters from this, you've got sound voices and waveforms from that, you've got all of the presets from all of the synths. It's like the greatest hits of everything Oberheim have ever done, stuffed into a single, into a single synth. It's great. It can't be anything other than extraordinary, I imagine. And this, of course, is not going to be a casual synthesizer for casual people. This is a collector's item. This is the synthesizer that all of those people with money to invest in synths have wanted. And here it is. And it's going to sell by extremely small bucket loads. <laughs> <laughs> because not everybody has five grand to drop on a synthesizer. But there's no doubt that the Oberheim OBX8 is an absolute doozy. What a thing. <laughs> it's exactly what everybody wanted. I don't think there's really anything more to say about that. Go and check out some of the demos. Go and check out what you think it sounds like. But this is a synthesizer for the synthesis. The synthesizer for those people who really value that kind of level of workmanship, that historical connection, that legacy, and ultimately the quality of the sound that you're going to be getting out of it. It's a synthesizer to be enjoyed, a synthesizer to, to sit in part of your studio amongst your other collection that just oozes class and sound and fabulousness. It is absolutely a modern classic to go alongside, I imagine, your Moog 1 and your Prophet 10 and things like that. It's a real synth person's synthesizer. Uh, the Roland stuff. Now Roland weren't at Super Booth. Who knows why? Maybe they couldn't afford it. Nobody knows. It doesn't really matter. But pr leading up to it, they released three little Ira compact 
synthesizers. What are these? These are mini synths. Everyone's doing mini synths. You're going to see more mini synths, I think, in the very near future from all sorts of places. But mini synths seems to be seems to be the cool thing right now. <laughs> Did Behringer just start it? Well, they couldn't have done because everyone's been working on these for a couple of years. It's weird how these trends happen. There must have been something a couple of years ago. Everyone was just thinking, oh, everybody needs. Volkers. The Korg Volker is where it's all been at all this time and we've just not really noticed. So let's tie into that. So here we have the Ira Compact. So what is it? Well, it's three little synths which are put together as a fabulously Roland infused little techno acid workstation. It's brilliant. Oh, it's just totally brilliant. I mean, these are tiny weeny things that annoys me a little bit. Tiny weeny controls, which are frustrating. But heck, man, you get the plug-in version of their absolutely authentically modelled ACB range <laughs> virtual versions of their literal classics. What was I saying? So yeah, in the T8 beat machine, you get uh, an 808, a 909, a 606, but also a 303. So it has the baseline built in. So this really is the coolest one. It's a drum machine and acid baseline all built into a tiny little form factor. Fantastic. Get that running. Then alongside, you've got the J6 chord synthesizer. Now this is a Juno 106 kind of inside from which you can create pads and chords and you've got this chord sequencer. So you've got your bass line and your drums going on in your T8 and then on this you've got chords and stuff, stabs and that coming in. Fantastic. And then lastly, weirdly, you've got the E4 voice tweaker. Now this is one of these weird voice transformation things that makes you sound like an idiot. Or can add awesome reverb and, and sound and harmonies and things like that to your voice. So I think what Roland are thinking is that you've got your chords, you've got your drum and your bass, and then you sing along with it. So it's a perfect collection of three little modules that you can plug into, sync them all together, sing through, and you are performing at your local electronic open mic night or gig or down the park. It's all battery powered, all that kind of thing. They look great, they're very simple to use, you just whack them together and off you go and start making music. Fun, about 200 quid each. Ooh, so, you know, a little more on the, towards the pricier side of these sorts of mini synths, but so, you know, so more expensive than a Korg Volker, for instance, but heck, it's got Roland written on it. <laughs> Create Audio managed to squeeze out a little synthesizer for Superbooth. They're calling it the East Beast. And it's a fun little subtractive mono synth with Pittsburgh modular oscillations, Pittsburgh modular filter, and bags full of fun and character and sequencing and weird stuff going on inside as well. It looks like this. I've done a full review of this on the channel, so do go and check that out. But it's a great, it's a great little mono synth. It's got this fantastic buttery filter from Pittsburgh modular in there, and a fun sequencer, a clackety clackety keyboard, patch points. You can drop it into your modular if you want comes out of the case or just use it standalone fantastic very affordable very awesome and i imagine there might be another one just around the corner meanwhile talking of pittsburgh of course they're also doing their own thing with their weird safari collection of modules uh, richard nickel has been demonstrating the increasing ballooning range of Pittsburgh modular modules which are designed around strange animals and concepts and ideas and so they've just put out the scary safari which is something like a feast of crows and what is it you've got a filter of crows a weird unique filter which uses weird unique things and has a crow on the front you've got the wolf a channel strip and VCA and then the dynamics controller bat or the, the bat controller. I don't know, depending on which you say it. But anyway, these modules continue to appear in limited numbers and then disappear again. And then in the following month, you get something else. And all of this, along with the work with Create Audio, seems to be heading towards something big. I ran into Gertz almost immediately at Superbooth, <laughs> which was fantastic, because he dragged me into the Erica Sense room and then pumped me full of this strange purple liquid. Some kind of weird Latvian liqueur, I think, which kind of had me hallucinating for the rest of the day, but it was fantastic. But anyway, Erica Synths had two things in particular at uh, Super Bowl this year. The first was the Syntrix 2, which was the second version of their kind of premier awesome synth. It's based a little bit around something like the EMS Synthy, and it has that kind of, that kind of 
exploration, that kind of pedigree, that kind of desire to be something really, really special. I mean, with the version 2, they've moved beyond that kind of creamy, creamy whitey number they had going on, back to their, back to where they're most comfortable in their deep, dark blackness. It's got a wonderful glowy VU meter on the front, and it has a couple of oscillators with wave shaping, a filter, fantastic matrix mixer sitting in the middle so you can route all of your modulation to all of your bits to all of your other places. In terms of new stuff, they've added a delay and a ring modulator, as well as recording of the joystick movements as a modulator. It has a new and improved input system, including an envelope follower for the first input, so you can extract the shape of that incoming signal and use that as modulation elsewhere. They've taken out the speakers, thank goodness, and you know, just overall, it looks like a deep, dark, awesome synthesizer. The other thing they had was the LXR. Now this is the drum section, the drum voice that's been pulled out of the LXR02, which is something that they made in collaboration with Sonic Potions. It's a, it's a digital based drum machine and inside it you've got six voices of different forms of digital crunchy noise nastiness in order to generate six different drum tones. This has all been extracted into CV, so you've got CV triggers, but also CV accents and modulations. And it's all digital, so there's a lot of bit of menu messing about to route stuff from various places to other places. The important thing to note is that it's purely the sounds. The actual drum machine section, that's in the desktop unit, the LXR02. And if you want drum sequence, and of course in Eurac, then Erica Synth has its own drum sequencer to take care of that sort of thing. But otherwise, you can use it with anything. The Faco were there having a fabulous time, I have to say, and thank you very much for the beer. That was much appreciated, Manu. But what they had to show new, they had a few things. They've always got new stuff coming along, including the DivKid Stereo Strip, of course, and also they've ported those sorts of things into VCV Rack, and they had that running. And that gives a little indication of of what their newest module is about, called the ACDC. It's nothing to do with those of us who are about to rock. This has everything to do with getting CV and audio into and out of your door to your modular. Modular to door, door to modular, that kind of thing. So it's a DC coupled audio interface. Four channels in, four channels out. You can take audio in and out via USB, plugged into the front, I think, yeah. <laughs> or, or control voltage. If you have a control voltage compatible door, something like Bitwig or Ableton Live with the CV tools, extension in it, you can shift modulation or sequencing from one place to another. I'm looking forward to trying this out at some point and I'll report back on what I find. But what it does look like is a very affordable, simple way of just getting your door and your modular to play nicely together. Teenage Engineering surprised us all a little bit with the OP1 field, because it's not an OP2, which is would have been more would have been less surprising had it been called the OP2. But no, this is the OP1 field. So it's the OP1 like the original OP1, which is like a decade old now. It's a fabulous little small form factor, synthesizer, sampler, recorder, mixer, effects processor kind of kind of deal. And it's beloved of hipsters and fashionable people, as we know, but a lot of people get a lot of fun out of it. I mean, I never really thought much about it until I had one in my hands. And then I kind of realized that, wow, this is a, a fabulous piece of gear. I mean, just look at it. It's just brilliant. I can absolutely see why people really get in to this sort of thing. I mean, sure, it's it's small and compact, and that has its challenges. But it's also, you know, bright and creative and and interesting, and it has limitations which make it actually quite exciting to use. Now, the OP1 field takes all of that loveliness and <laughs> sort of mutes out the colours a bit, tries to make it just that little bit more sophisticated, and throws in a hundred new features. But ultimately what you get is a synthesizer, a sampler, a controller, it's got built-in sensors, it's got four track recording and effects processing. So you can write entire tracks on this little thing or use it as part of what they're calling a field system. The field system, which includes a fabulously small TX6 mixer and now the OP1 field. That's all gonna come together. Costs about two grand, sorted. What? Oh, you want to talk about the price, <laughs> right? You want to talk about the price. 
Yeah, I mean, there is that. It is expensive for a, a piece of gear that's about sort of this sort of big, that's a four track recorder. It does seem that way, yes. But I don't know, I think people just need to chill out. I think we're allowed to have uh, premium bits of gear that cost a load of money. I think that's okay. <laughs> You know, if that's not for you, it's not for you, but it doesn't mean it's not for everybody. Some people like really nice watches, you know, nice cars, nice gear, nice clothes, labels and brands and stuff. You know, there's nothing wrong with having a premium brand. There's nothing wrong with charging a load of money for something which has cost a lot to develop and engineer. That's fine, go for it. Some good stuff coming in from Dreadbox. They had on show the new Dismetria, Dismet Tria, uh, possibly. I don't know. This is done in the style of the dysphonia. Am I making sense? I don't know. They did this little uh, kit synth uh, at last super booth, which was which was great. I did a video on it, a sort of a build video. You have to put it together yourself a little bit. There's not a huge amount of soldering you have to do, but a little bit. Put it together, and you end up with a very cool synth voice that can either sit on your desktop on pegs. Or you can drop it into your Eurac. Now they've done that again with something called the Dysmetria. And this is more of a groove thing, more of a percussive thing, perhaps even a bit like the Moog DFAM, you could say. Similar idea in that you've got a couple of oscillators, a bunch of noise, and you've got a, a cycle of steps that can run through in order to create and generate rhythms, both percussive and melodic. Uh, well, at least I think so. It looks great. It's like 200 quid. I think they're probably already sold out. I ordered one and should receive it. I believe it's on the way. So in a couple of weeks, I'll have a video on the build of that too. It looks great. But perhaps the bigger news is that they are going to do this same format too the original Erebus and the Hades. Now these are two little synthesizers of theirs which have always been very well regarded. I remember the Re the Erebus was one of the, the first little synths I was thinking of getting. I was tossing up between that, the No Coast and the Mother 32. And I thought it was an awesome little synth. And now they're going to do it in this little DIY kit version that you can drop into Eurac. Fantastic. Just fantastic. Hades, similar idea. Fantastic. I hope this this carries on because these are great. You could end up with a whole rack full of these little <laughs> great little synths and the front panels are awesome. You know, the patching potential is awesome. And of course the quality of the components is, is great inside. So that's super. I'm looking forward to all of those and I hope to do videos on the whole lot. Meanwhile in Cherry Audio Land, they keep coming up with their own, <laughs> their own artificial celebrations of things. The first one was they decided it was Moog month. And so in order to celebrate that, and everyone's going, is it, what, what was it? Who, what, who said, is there some kind of committee or something? No, no, apparently no, it is, because Cherry Audio says it is. And so they released the mini mode, which is their emulation of the mini mode. And it's, it's brilliant. It's pretty just awesome. Uh, I've had a bit of a play on it and I wasn't planning to sort of do anything about it. They sent it to me saying, hey, yeah, give this a go. And I went, yeah, yeah, whatever, oh, what's the mini mode? Yeah, great. No, that's really nice and I, I lost myself in an hour of just <laughs> just playing with it mapping a few MIDI controls because this is software you understand this is a virtual instrument this is not a piece of hardware so I had to map it to my MIDI controller and then enjoyed it greatly it does have a really good sort of a chunky fat gnarly sound to it that was, that was really nice yeah good job they did on that and then they've just followed it up by I think generating an international synthesizer day i don't know whether it really was an international synthesizer day but cherry audio seemed to think it was and they seem to be in charge of these things so on that day they bizarrely released the lowdown now the lowdown is a take on the taurus the taurus being a moog floorboard synthesizer that was great for people playing in prog rock bands you know they already playing four synthesizers like this so they could now get their feet involved i can't get my foot on get, now get their feet involved playing bass notes on the Taurus. So boom, dee -dee 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 boom, 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 that kind of thing. And so uh, recently you might have seen that Behringer are gonna do a clone of it, but without the foot pedals. Why? <laughs> anyway, this is also without foot pedals because it's virtual, it's a software synthesizer, but on the screen, on the GUI, you do get the floor pedals and more importantly, you get carpet shining through the pedals and you can choose from 14 different carpets. See, there's an attention to detail that you don't often find. 
I think that's awesome. Acid Rain Constellation is a long form polymetric pattern generator. What the heck does that mean? Well, we don't know. They weren't at Superboost, so we weren't able to ask them. But as far as we know, it looks a lot like the one here, this one, this fell here, the Maestro. You just about see the buttons along the bottom here. The Maestro LFO. So a similar sort of form factor, loads and loads of buttons on the front. But this one is an eight channel pattern generator. Hmm. Very, very interesting. It says it can create long and involving trigger and gate sequences that will be poked around by Euclidean. This Euclidean guy gets in everywhere. Everywhere he does. He, I mean, I hope he copyrighted it or something so that he's getting some money out of all this malarkey because everybody's using his algorithms, man. Everybody. And in this one, it is designed apparently to push these, these very ordered algorithms into very uncomfortable places. So Constellation takes one of your, your standard Euclidean rhythms and then dwells on it, thinks on it, farts around with it in order to create very complex outcomes. Apparently, it can generate up to 999 melodically interesting steps of, of stuff before repeating on itself. And honestly, that's quite an extraordinary thing. So yeah, looking forward to seeing more about that. Now, camped over in the upstairs main part of Superbooth were Soma Labs. <laughs> They were like having their own festival. It was like a little cultic gathering. This table and this backdrop of, of weirdness. The table covered in electronic strangeness and things and wobbly bits and twangy things connected into connection of cables. People just, you know, their minds being broken and reshaped and floating away. It was a mad, it was a mad time. But I, I think, I think we got through it. But what they had to bring with them this time was something called Terra. Now, Terra is a microtonal algorithmic synthesizer built into a tree. So yeah, you've got a slice of wood, a lovely slice of ringed treeness, into which you've got these buttons and these sensors, and this stuff is infused in there somehow. And you explore it with your fingers, with your mind, probably with your tongue and, and other bits and pieces, and it generates uh, sound, it generates noise, it generates music. It's much more designed to be an instrument than it is just to be a synthesizer. So it's something that you would you would inhabit somehow and, and play it and enjoy it and massage out of it all sorts of different things. They've got a completely mad video which shows it off, which is just extraordinary. Nobody does anything like Soma Labs. They are just a thing unto themselves and it's glorious. I, I absolutely adore it. So what can I tell you about it? Well, it's sort of based on the reflex engine that they've been, uh, that Vlad has been working on for a little while. We saw it before with a strange transparent controller that he was playing with wired into some kind of laptop, doing weird things between the two. So this is very much a digital engine that's using algorithms to generate musically interesting stuff. I can't really tell you any more than that, to be honest, but it is a, a beautiful, a beautiful voyage of discovery. Now I was lucky enough to get my hands on one of these just before Superbooth called the Kikane from Nobula. Nobula you might know from their polycinematic, their, their polyphonic synthesizer within a little module module. This is not like that at all. It looks, the color scheme is very similar, but what this is, is a very clever kick drum and sidechain compressor. Why is that clever? Well, because side chaining is one of those things where the idea is that you take the beat of your kick drum, you use that beat to kind of pull in a space for that kick drum in a mix. Because if you've got a load of stuff going on, you've got all your synths, you've got your kick drum, everything else, your percussion, all going on all at once, sometimes it's really hard to feel that beat, the urgency of that beat, the immediacy of that beat. And what side chaining does is pull down the mix to allow that kick drum just to come through. People have been using it in dance music for years. It's a, it's a very well known, tried and tested method of creating a, a pulsing, banging vibe uh, in, a, in a techno gig, essentially. Kikane does that in a module. But while there are other side chain compressors out there which do this, and it's a bit of a thing at the moment to have one of these, this particular module includes the kick drum in the module, making the whole thing less complicated. 
and easy, which is exactly what I like. I like that sort of thing. So what you do is you get your module, stick your mix into it, just your mix output, stick that in, and then take that to your speakers. Now this has got your kick drum in. So you throw your trigger, your kick drum trigger to this, and then you've got a knob where you set the side chain level and your mix is automatically compressed away every time that kick drum comes through. Kick drum is based on a 909 style, a drum, which I suppose you could say is a little bit restrictive because you're, you're kind of stuck with that. But if that's the kind of kick drum you're using anyway, and you've got quite a lot of control over the, the timbre and feel of that, then it's absolutely ideal. It's just superb. And the result is, which is what's more important at the end of the day, is that you drop it into your rack and turn it on. Sounds flipping awesome. It just sounds fantastic. I've done like a, uh, a first impressions video of this, so do go and check that out. But it's a great module. I just absolutely love it. And that's going to be a permanent resident within my case. So how are we doing? I don't think we're even halfway through yet. Right, let's keep the pace up. So coming up now is Look Mum No Computer. Now, sadly, Sam wasn't able to get to Super Booth because he screwed up his passport. <laughs> Because being British and that, we need to have proper passports these days. We can't just travel to places. You've got to have all the paperwork in order, which is just awesome. Anyway, what's he doing? Well, his Cosmo format, which is a fantastic 5U version of Eurorack, which is awesome. I love it. I've got a whole load of the stuff over there that I'm planning to build one day in the next couple of years. And the idea is that you have this size of modular in order to be able to use it easier in live performance so that you're not having to do with tiny little knobs. That's awesome. Now he's done a complete flip reversal on that and the mate of his is developing the Eurorack sized version of his Cosmo modules. And ultimately that's a brilliant idea because his style of modules are great. He's put them together himself, designed the circuits, or got them from various places, put them together. Brilliant artwork on the front panels. Really interesting, good, solid, basic stuff for live performance. And now there's going to be Eurorack versions of them. Fantastic. I think that's just completely awesome. And I hope he sells them by the bucket load. Because <laughs> that's just brilliant. Meanwhile, I will go and build my own proper Metric 5U Cosmo modules, coming soon. Arturia has released an update to their very popular V collection of synthesizers, taking it up to 32 instruments, which is brilliant. What I like about the Arturia collection is that it's not just synths. You've also got electric pianos in there, acoustic pianos in there, a very interesting range and selection of both digital and analog and hybrid synthesizers. It's, it's a great collection and I love the way it continues to build. Uh, this time around they've added in the Korg MS-20, which sounds pretty phenomenal, I have to say. It's just as gnarly and badly behaved as you imagine it is. They've also stuffed in there their first bits from their augmented range. Now this is uh, a selection of strings, a selection of voices, which have a weird mix with synthesizer things and pulsing and rhythms and you know that thing where you get a, a, an orchestral library and you mess it about that's what augmented strings and augmented voices is all about and that's in there they've also squeezed in the sq80 which they had already previously released and they've done a bunch of updates to things like the cs80 the piano and they've also pulled the profit apart into profit 5 and profit vs which I think is good rather than having them combined in the same synthesizer. So now if you run the whole thing together, you've got over 14,000 presets, which is ridiculous. <laughs> Absolutely ridiculous. Coming in from a completely different planet, we have Star Waves from Sonic Planet. It's a beautiful visually infused weirdo synthesizer that generates sonic architectures within space using your samples and, and tracks and bits and pieces. You pull your audio into a manipulable 3D space and send it off in gravitational swirls of, of masses and world building and this pull and stretching of architecture and twisting of sound and all of that applies to to the sound both visually and sonically. Rather than actually interacting with the samples themselves, you kind of design the conditions upon which they build themselves into these worlds of music. It's just fascinating, just go and play with it. Don't take my word for it. The second 
of the new tech boxes from Korg has come along, called the NTS-2, would you believe? The NTS-1 was this little synthesizer with effects processing inside it. The NTS-2 is absolutely not that. It is really an oscilloscope. Fascinating oscilloscope. One with four channels, very much like the Mordax Data, but at not anywhere near the price, and it doesn't take up any room in your Euro rack. But it's more than that. Inside it actually has a dual waveform generator, so it can create its own oscillations, so you can use it as an LFO, or as an oscillator for that matter. It's also got a tuner built in, which is awesome for tuning your different oscillators. It's like a multifunctional tool that you can have that's just USB or battery powered, knocking around that you can plug things into. I mean, the scopes, you can put it anywhere. So you don't have to rearrange your rack in order to get your, your rack mounted Euro rack scope next to the thing you're trying to look at. It will also do full color spectrum analysis so you can see exactly what your frequencies are doing. What a fabulous thing. But what is also great is that it comes with a brand new Korg edition of Patch and Tweak. Now this is written by Kim Bjorn, the same guy who wrote all the uh, other Patch and Tweak books. But this one focuses expressly upon Korg and ARP uh, synthesizers. But perhaps even more importantly than that, it shows you how to use the NTS-2 correctly. Because Korg manuals are notoriously terrible for this sort of thing. Whereas this takes you through step by step exactly how to use it, exactly what to set it to, the sort of scenarios you'll be using it in. And I can tell you that that's absolutely <laughs> very, very important. Because I've got one of these fellas here, which is not dissimilar to the NTS-2, I'd have to say, although it only gives me sort of one channel of stuff, I think. But I've no idea what I'm doing with any of these buttons. You just keep fiddling with stuff until you get something like you think it should look like. And so actually having some guidance in how to use a scope properly, I think is absolutely invaluable. And it all comes together as a bundle. A Qubit weren't at Superbooth this year, sadly, but they had a new thing that was out, although it's a new old thing. We've seen this knocking around for a couple of years, I think, called the Aurora, but it's finally made it into existence. And it's a strange reverb. Strange because it's a spectral reverb. It does weird things to time in that it stretches reverb tails, does strange things with cybernetic metallic <laughs> effects, blurring, and other bits of nonsense. Suffice to say that it's a very controllable artificial reverb with all sorts of strange granular stuff and bending and warping and other things you wouldn't normally associate with reverb which generally just creates a space around you. So I think it could be a fascinating module and I do hope to get my hands on one at some point. We love the earthiness of Herbs and Stones with their liquid foam and their gentle wham. I think it's called so far, but now they've got a new thing coming out. I think it's still a prototype, it's still bubbling away under the surface. And they're calling it Pathways, because it's an adventure, it's a journey, it's a, it's a road down which we are travelling. And what is it? Well, it's a Matrix Mixer. Oh yes, we love our Matrix Mixers, there's a lot of those about just at the minute. This is a 4x4 Matrix Mixer, a desktop one, although it is also Eurac compatible. But it has all sorts of interesting and weird things going on, like it's kind of got drive on every channel. One channel has an envelope follower which you can pull back in, which then cascades into, into other things. All of the channels could be pushed into self-oscillation, which is a little bit unexpected. And it sort of does this thing where it transforms itself into a a weirdly polyphonic drone machine or something. But anyway, this is definitely one for those earthy cool kids out there who like their who likes their stuff meaty and somehow connected to the world while still being extraordinary and unusually unique and characterful. Which brings us nicely, I think, to the fine gear dirt magnet. This is a massive desktop analog effects unit. I think it's all analog. Some of it might not be. I don't really remember. Anyway, it's a big thing. Slap it on your desk and you've got noise generation, crackle generation. You've got LFOs, ring modulator, voltage control filter, and a real life genuine. There it is. You can see it going around. Tape delay. So it's like a box of vintage, vintage style analog effects, I suppose, with its own modulation, with its own noise source. I mean, noise and crackle are slightly two different things that you can mix in, either just generating noise itself to be used through the filter for other bits and pieces, or you can run audio through it to pick up that sound along the way and mix it alongside. The filter itself is based on the MS-20, so it's a gnarly, spitting, fierce old 
bit of a filter and at the bottom as you can see you've got this marvelous section of tape and the other thing they've got is a matrix mixer another matrix mixer yes i know i mean this one is similarly enormous and is going to sit on everything but this one is more of a matrix mixer with a channel strip so you've got four channels but then you've got eq as well as volume panning auxiliary sends everything else so it turns it into sort of a big playhouse of uh, of a mixer for your synthesizer bits and pieces and of course connecting to the dirt magnet and the dust attractor or whatever it was their other one was I feel like I'm starting to lose it already and there's still quite a way to go. So query quickly, well, so this one is from Viram. It's an octopus. What does that mean? Oh, I don't really know. I saw this before. Superbooth didn't really see it at the show and I haven't heard anybody talk about it since. So I don't even know if the guy went in the end. But what it is, is a, is a wide rack of eight Euclidean, there's that guy again, Euclidean pattern generators. So you've got eight of them within the complete unit with like a master brain in the middle. So you, it's like a drum machine, but based upon these ever famous uh, Euclidean algorithms in order to generate different bits. But you can control them, you can mute them in and out. It's like having a massive controller for a percussion based system. Very, very interesting. There was also rumored that it was gonna do one as a single module as well, which I thought could be quite interesting in Eurac form. But all I can do is kind of point this out and say, look, this looked really interesting, but I don't really know anything more about it than that. Go and check it out. Meanwhile, at Basto Instruments, they're having pizza. What was this about? I don't know. I just loved it. I, I get caught up in things sometimes, particularly when it's a digital oscillator that I don't know anything about. And it just goes, wow, this is somehow interesting and exciting. And I would like to be interesting and exciting too. So I'm going to get one of those and, and definitely have a fabulous time not getting on with it and then hiding it in a drawer somewhere. So that's what the pizza's all about. <laughs> it's got a lot of FM tones in there, a lot of weirdness stuff going on. But what I loved was this, this launch video with the animated story of Lizzie, was it, going on some kind of journey and ending up with pizza. Pizza in a module. Why pizza? Nobody knows. <laughs> Nobody knows. But I'm looking forward to getting my fingers into those complex oscillations, cross wave forming and folding, shaping, FMing, and any other bits and pieces it wants to throw at me. The Polyend Play was finally revealed at Superbooth. This is some kind of groove box. It comes with 3,000 sounds and 30 drum kits, and it's very much a sample based machine but it seemed sort of both simpler and shallower than we thought as well as being more complicated so i don't think i've really fully wrapped my head around it i love the grid array of stuff you've got going on i've always appreciated being able to visualize the sequence but as far as i can work out you kind of put a sample on each step and it and it sort of plays i'm not quite sure where the melody stuff comes in is it all drum based is it all just one hit samples i mean there's a lot of talk about randomization and step repeat and action combos whatever that may mean but but is it like an ovation circuit is it like a deluge or is it something else um i mean the grid <laughs> the grid looks great but I, i'm just i haven't quite grasped what any of it is all about yet but you can definitely send midi out to stuff oh yes that's very important and you can definitely stick samples in it that much I know, and you can press buttons so that they light up. So, so, so good then. Tell me more about it in the comments. Now, Endorphins have collaborated with Andrew Wang to produce Ghost. Ghost is a module which is packed full of that compression, that channel strip, that side chaining that I was talking about, and it has elements of distortion, um, stereo processing, reverb, delay and other kind of multi-functions. I think the idea is that it contains all of the things that Andrew likes to use when he's processing the final end of his audio. So sidechaining to let that kick through, some reverb, some delay, some distortion, some grunge, all of these different modules within a module, which is certainly interesting. It looks really, really busy. That's, that's really the, the thing that, that occurs to me most from it. It's like, you've got a lot of stuff packed in here. I'm not quite sure how usable that's going to be in that in that smaller space. But it's great to see those sort of collaborations come together because someone like Andrew just has such a depth of experience and grasp of what it is he's trying to achieve that anything, anything of that brain coming into our Eurac has got to be surely a good thing. So, I mean, he must have thought about, he must have thought about 
the the packedness of all that and how that works. He must have done. So it can't be as bad as it looks, uh, I would imagine. But I haven't really seen any deep depots. I haven't really seen any deep demos of it yet, but I imagine they will be forthcoming. One interesting thing he did say, though, which I really liked in response to the OP1 field, is that his his flip sampler app can do all of that and more, and it costs like 10 bucks on your iPhone. So, you know, it's just a thought. Now, many years ago, even Tide released a Euro module called the, the Delay, DDL, something or other. I've got it somewhere. Where is it? I did a video on it. Anyway, it was pretty great. It was a good, solid delay module with some really interesting things and a few flaws. But, you know, good. And I kind of hope that even Tide would carry on with this. I've been long time expecting a nice big fat reverb like their, their black hole reverb or a space delay or something of that nature that even Tide are really good at. So I wasn't really expecting what their next module would be. And I don't think anybody is quite sure, really. But it's called Misha. And it's an interval instrument. What does that mean? Well, it means rather than having some kind of keyboard to play, you've got a row of buttons that uh, define the interval from the last note. So you've got plus one. So if you hit plus one, you go up one note, plus two, go up two notes, plus four, go up four notes, etc. And you've got pluses and you've got minuses. And so using that, you can kind of generate these interval based moving melodies very easily, very simply, and quite beautifully. I have to say that the demos coming out of Superbooth just kind of left me underwhelmed. Looking at this thing going, this is kind of fascinating. There's something in here which is awesome. I can feel it. I can feel it in my water. Something in that screen in the middle which looks underutilized at the moment but kind of shows the scale that you're using and the, uh, and the different notes that are coming up. But it has a, has a sequencer inside. It can, it can do multi channels of stuff which means ultimately chords. Three channels of it. I believe. And yet the, the demo which was tied just to a disting, I think playing a multi multi channel instrument by a MIDI, was like, this is this is not it. This is not not what I think it should be. <laughs> this should be making beeps and farts, but massively over an entire rig, doing interesting things, you know, incorporating into locking and interweaving melodies because you can stick it to a scale and then you can't go far wrong playing with the buttons. So interesting ridiculously wide module thought-provoking head scratching strangely demoed which just makes you think there has to be more than this could there be more to this let's hope so even tired if you're out there send one through and i'll give it a thorough going over i stopped by the jolien labs booth at super booth and they treated me to a bunch of noise in a number of different modules which was interesting. The, the funny thing was is that I'd written about these modules before I went to Superbooth because I, I saw that they'd released them. I think they were on Modular Grid or something. And they had some terrible photos on Instagram with them with a pink background. And I'm looking at these things going, what, what are they? But I thought, well, they're kind of interesting. And I like the other things that they've done, these weird noise-based car crash modules, which look fantastic with weird lights and stuff going on and just sound like some kind of nightmare. And so I thought, well, these, these could be interesting, but I couldn't really wrap my head around what they were. And so just wrote the words going, oh, I don't really know. But they um, but when I was actually there, they grabbed hold of me, pulled me into their tent and said, oh, look at this stuff. And I went, oh, all right, then <laughs> might have to. Where's my next beer coming from? But anyway, so what they've done is they've got four new modules, I think it is. These are the start of a, of a kind of a new format for them, which is using a single PCB and panel together. So you haven't got a separate front panel and PCB that goes onto each other. It's just a single piece. And so that means that all the components, all the hardware components on the front are very much there, sort of naked. And that makes it weird, but interesting. It feels like it's sticking out of your Eurac further than most other things would. And I suppose it is, because you've got these components mounted now on the front panel just that so you've got one single unit. But then these are all done as kits, which makes them super easy to build. You haven't got to worry about getting things connected together across two different panels. You're just soldering on the back of one, on the other side, you're sticking on the, the hardware and off you go. But I mean, that's that concept in by itself was kind of interesting and sort of fruity. But then what they were actually had was also just sort of strange and out there, but also fantastic. They had this 
cascading LFO, which was like nine LFOs, I think, in a row, but you had these strange touch points between them. So you touched one and touched the other, and that sort of connected them together, or it sped them up and slowed them down. So rather than using a knob in order to change the rate, you were using these strange touch things, which kind of gave this idea that you could be running your fingers across them in order to throw the LFOs all over the place, rather than oh, trying to dial something in. You just go, whoa, I'll get my fingers in there, and it starts to to go. They also had this filter which was on these naked sliders. <laughs> I don't know why I call them naked, it just seems to be the appropriate term that you could play with which then also had touch points that would make it just go go crazy <laughs> into other places. Uh, they had a bunch of stuff like that. Fascinating. And it really brought home to me that looking at a module on paper is never the same as actually seeing it demonstrated properly and talked about properly. It is always difficult to ascertain what's going on in a module just purely by reading the text. That's why it's so important to do demo videos of this stuff. Every time, if you're a modular maker releasing a module, do a video. It doesn't matter how terrible the video is, doesn't matter how terrible your, your patch is, just do something to show what it does. Because the words, the words don't mean nothing. Don't mean nothing. You've gotta, gotta see it in action. Well, this is a complex non-linear polyphonic MPE sequencer thingy. It's got one of those names that I'm never quite sure how to pronounce. I'm going to go for Seek Emperor. Seek MPE. -ra. Oh, I don't know. <laughs> it has something to do with gestural sequencing. I'm not really sure what that is either, but this is designed by the same guy who did the granulize um, thing, device. It's kind of a Max for Live sort of thing. It runs beautifully within Ableton Live, within that kind of environment, and does fascinating and interesting things. Uh, this one is designed to explore the full potential of MPE, because we've all got MPE compatible synths and bits and pieces now. It's just that we don't necessarily have the controller to generate the data, and perhaps, as this piece of software suggests, there are other ways of doing that. Why do we have to be restricted to using these kinds of controllers when we could be generating patterns and interesting polyphonic um, expressions within software because software has the power to do it and so this is all about that there seems to be eight channels I, I think you've got sliders and you can introduce probability and different things and modulations going on for uh, pressure for aftertouch for individual pitch bend velocity all those sorts of things are built within this beautiful looking interface I think the gesture side of it is that you can use like trackpad gestures or touch screen gestures, mouse gestures, I don't really know to be honest, <laughs> I don't know. it seems to be a fundamental part but I don't really understand what it means, I mean if you were in some kind of virtual reality then I can understand the, the gesture mechanics, I don't quite understand how that works in a 2D environment, but anyway, who knows, I haven't had time to look at it in any depth, but it's out there, it's looking awesome, I would recommend going to have a play. In a distant corner of Superbooth somewhere was Quanalog analog and the butterfly complex oscillator. Now I'm never quite sure what's going on with complex oscillators, they seem just far too complex to me. It seems to be about using one to mess the other one about in really unruly and unnecessary ways. Using all sorts of FM indexing and cross modulations and carriers and operators and all of those kind of weird things and really you just want to get waveform out of something so you can filter it and turn it into a banging bass line. Don't you? I mean, don't you? But no, apparently not. But what was particularly special about the butterfly oscillator is that it has no primary and secondary oscillator. Either of them can be anything, and anything can be either of them. You've got a lot of scope for cross-modulation in both directions, rather than one being subservient to the other. They have this ability to wave-fold into each other. And the interesting thing about the mix output is that you can kind of sequence through waveforms as part of its modulation. So you can be constantly generating uh, interesting new sounding things with every single step in your sequencer. And as with all complex oscillators, it's a massive thing, a massive thing covered in knobs and patch points for all sorts of fascinating stuff. Now this guy just builds all the things by himself, so it's a little bit slow moving. But hopefully, with the, the coverage he's got at Superbooth and with people's encouragement, he can find better ways to produce stuff so he's not just having to hand solder each, each module by himself. 
And this is one of the beauties of Superbooth. It gives an absolute opportunity for very small manufacturers to crash into larger ones and start sharing some of the load and learning from each other and bringing fantastic little ideas from a little company into a much bigger space and to a much wider audience. And I really hope that happens with Quinalog. Nearly there, nearly there, I promise. Just a few more, a couple more. Uh, busy circuits, ALM, ALM, busy circuits. I don't know which one it is. ALM, who cares? The ASQ1 was something that they brought along about five years ago, <laughs> apparently, but never ended up making. But now they have. What is it? It's a little sequencer. It's a little sequencer. You've got two channels of melodic, four channels of percussive, and a little lovely clacky mechanical keyboard type keyboard thing to make it all happen. Fantastic. You sequence stuff in an SH-101 style. What that means is you hit a note and every note goes into the sequence and you can press rest and tie instead and that does something slightly different. But you're not having to play it in or hold something and dial it in. No, you just press press keys and the sequence appears. And you've got two channels of that, CV and gate. And then you've got four gate outputs and you can use the little things in order to play the drums and you can see them cycle around as it goes through the eight notes. Um, loads and loads of steps, unlike 128 on the melodic and 64 on the percussive. Great little fun, instant, off you go. There you are, type sequencer. I really liked it. I like those sorts of things. It looks to me like the sort of thing I could pop into my rack here and it could run the show. It's got enough. I mean, you've got a bass line and a lead line. You've got to have four channels of drums. Yeah, yeah, that's a, an entire techno set right there. The Clovis Granular Filter. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure they're awesome, right? I'm sure they're a lovely bunch of guys, and I'm sure there's a whole bunch of people who like to sit there and just listen to a filter sweep and go, oh, yeah, 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 man, that's, that's, that's the stuff right there. So this was a granular filter, and I, I couldn't work it out. <laughs> I kept seeing the video going, why can't we hear why can't we hear it in something i mean okay i i appreciate there's some kind of granular graininess going on that it comes down to a certain level and it becomes very bitty and and scanny and and things like that so okay that's that's interesting but you know run a bass line through it man run a pad through it or something make it sound like something so this is evidently exciting because i've seen lots of people are very excited about it i just don't quite get it myself yet it's okay, I don't have to get it. If everybody else gets it, that's awesome. Just seems a little bit too cerebral for me. I'd like something a bit more a bit more visceral. I'd like to know what's going on. I'd like to have it chewing through a few bits. But if this excites you, then go and check out the the clavis. It's probably called something. I probably should work out what it's called. Oh, it's called the Granity. There you go. The Granity VCF. This one came up right before I was about to film this. It's called the Manipulator. It's from... One one three eight one is somebody's no it's one three L S three oh I don't know it's some bloke right making modules and he really likes noise and but also the outside and really wild things and so he's built this module that just looks like looks <laughs> looks like something crazy it's like I mean have you never never felt the need to balance something got this wadge of buttons over here it's got two thumb joysticks over here which you can't get your, you know things to it's got this strange thing in the middle with all the patch points at the front split up by this strange thing that gets in the way and it, looking at it I'm just going what well, well that's not real is it that looks like it's been photoshopped really poorly into something but no 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 apparently it's awesome apparently it, it's a real thing and I just need to dial it down a little bit and realize that uh, I've been talking for too long <sighs> So what is it? Well, the manipulator is a gate and joystick CV controller. It generates control voltage either on those two thumb joysticks or gates on that panel. I mean, it's a fabulous thing, really. It's just it clashes with my idea of design and balance and makes me feel stupid. Look at, look at it going, what? But it's what? No, 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 it's fine. Other people can design things however they want. That's, you know, it doesn't have to balance. It doesn't have to give me, uh, you know, an ordered feeling of the universe. It can be whatever brash nonsense you like. And that's what it is. 12 buttons, open gates, switch things, logic gates, turn things on and off, percussion, fire sequences, 
whatever you want, sequential switching, blah, 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 oh, and it's just gates, 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 patched into everything. Joysticks, X, Y, and also a push down as well. So that's an extra button, that's 14 buttons, I suppose, overall. And you can patch that to anything, you can range it in any way you like, you can either have them twang back into place or have them stay latched where they are. Great, <laughs> what, a, what an awesome thing to slap into your rig and then stuff it through everything. So you've got control, stabbing, finger control over all sorts of things and a bit of joystick stuff. Great, what a great use of, of space. And finally, very sadly, we lost Vangelis uh, this month, which, which was, yeah, which was something that I think I think a lot of us felt quite deeply. We're, we're very indebted, we feel, to Vangelis and the, the range and awesomeness of music that he produced way before anybody else thought it was cool. He was making synthesizer music of a certain cinematic nature. And that's amazing. And I personally absolutely do owe him a lot as one of the people who really inspired me into electronic music when I was little. I used to listen to his China album just over and over again. And there was one particular track called Chung Kuo, which just filled, somehow filled my entire soul when I was a little fella. That sequence going around, there's something about that sequence that was repeated and repeated. Meanwhile, the massive, epic, planetary-sized pads were moving around and changing underneath it while that sequence stayed the same. That was deeply affecting for me and I think influenced a whole load of stuff that I continue I continue to try to capture the the awesomeness and majesty of that sound. Even now I'm still trying to do that I think. And I, it was extraordinary. I mean, of course you've got the Blade Runner soundtracks and Chariots of Fire and all that sort of thing but it was that track it was that track off that China album that really blew my mind when I was a kid. So thank you for that, mate. And your influence on, on synthesizer music and electronic music will long, long be remembered. <sighs> that's that. That's enough, I think. I've been talking sitting here for hours now. That's plenty. <laughs> You've had it up to here with me. I know I have. So there's plenty of stuff I left out. and I'm, I'm sorry about that. If that was one of your favourite things that I missed. But... Well, hey, let's get together and talk about it. Let's talk about it this Sunday, whatever the heck date that is. Let's get together about 8 o'clock-ish, something like that, and we can chat about all the things we missed, all the things that we didn't, see what we liked. The other thing I'm doing at the moment is redesigning my website. The idea is that I want to produce written versions of the videos that I do, the ones that are appropriate, of course, like this one, the Molten Monthly. Would you prefer to have a written version? Would that be useful to you? You could read it on the bus rather than having to watch or listen to me doing it. I mean, there'll be some, some cons to that and that you wouldn't be able to see the demos in the background or see my face. For, for that matter. But it would allow me to lay out the products a bit better with links, product videos, and all sorts of other bits and pieces alongside. And maybe that will bear fruit. The other thing it will do will allow me to make full use of my affiliate links. Affiliate links are where I can direct you to Perfect Circuit, or I can direct you to Tomin in order to buy something. And then I get like I get like 10p each time you do that, which is awesome because I need I need new and exciting ways to fund all of this shenanigans I'm doing on this channel. So things like that would be really helpful, which reminds me to say that if you are going to buy something that you've seen in this video, please use the links in this video, because that again ties you to me and then I get a tiny bit of commission. Doesn't matter what you buy, I'm not trying to direct you towards one product or another, it's just simply a way that I can fund the channel that little bit more. If you want to fund me directly, then please do consider joining us on Patreon, where you can give me a couple of quid every month, and just really come into the community and support my work. And for that, you get access to uh, past tracks and previously unreleased bits and pieces. You get uh, access to the Discord channel where you can chat about all sorts of stuff and generally feel good about supporting my fine work that I do here on this channel. Other ways you can support me is simply by subscribing or you could buy a t-shirt or a mug through the merchandising down the bottom. All of these are just ridiculous attempts at trying to work out how on earth I can do this for a living rather than just as a, a part-time hobby. Maybe one day I'll get there, maybe I will. But otherwise, thanks for watching, and in the meantime, go and make some tunes.